Well, what is up, everybody? Good morning to you, and happy Sunday, or Monday, or Tuesday, or whatever day you are watching this on. I'm actually uh, kind of blown away uh, by how many messages and conversations we have where people um, that we don't even really know, or at least have never had an opportunity to connect with, um, are getting their hands on uh, on our Sunday service. And so uh, we're just thankful for what God does with this online platform that we get to have. And, uh, and so wherever you're watching from, or where, uh, whatever day it may be, uh, whether you're in your home right now on a Sunday morning, uh, or you're driving down the road, we are honored that you are here with us today. If you don't know who I am, my name is Brian Wood. I'm one of the pastors here at Seven Cities Church. And uh, you are here on a great day. And so uh, we are in a series called God's Heart for You. God's Heart for you, and uh, there isn't necessarily this kind of flow throughout the whole series to where they all kind of connect together. Um, it, they're just really like these, these I don't want to say standalone, but, but almost isolated messages to where um, they all flow from what we feel biblically um, are things that come from the heart of God for us. But they're also kind of isolated to where uh, you don't have to watch one to understand the other. And so I would encourage you that if you haven't had a chance uh, to listen to the previous two weeks of this series, you can do so, obviously, right here on our YouTube channel. Uh, But a lot of people don't know, and I would love to share this with you um, so that you can help share it as well. But we have a Seven Cities Church podcast, and so... Um, right now, it's just sermon content and, uh, and the message that, message that you see here. Um, but if you know somebody who isn't going to sit down and watch a video, but would be willing to listen to a podcast, maybe at the gym or driving, uh, make sure you find that uh, on the podcast app, wherever you, uh, wherever you listen to your podcast at, and share that with a friend. And we would be honored. And uh, obviously, we want to get the message of Jesus uh, far and wide. So speaking of the message of Jesus far and wide, here is what I want us to talk about today. God's heart for you is so winning, so winning. Some of y'all don't know what soul winning is because y'all didn't grow up like I did. Honky Tonk USA, baby, so winning. This was a big deal. And uh, we would have soul winning nights where you went to neighborhoods and you knocked on doors and you handed out tracks and you went downtown and you walked the streets and you was going on a soul winning mission, all right? So I'm using this term uh, lightly, but what I mean by that is we are, are, are created as, as the body of Christ when we come to, to, to know Christ, when we come into this relationship with him, the church is created and designed to be a vessel to win souls. Meaning, to guide people to life in Christ in regards to their salvation. God's heart, God's heart for us is to share the message of Jesus far and wide. To share the the, the message of Jesus near and close in every aspect of our life. Whether it's at work, whether it's at a ball field, whether it's at a grocery store, whether it's on a mission trip, whether it's on an online platform like YouTube, wherever it may be, God's heart for you and I. Is to be able to share the message of his son Jesus with everybody and anyone that we come in contact with. There's a passage, um, really just a verse that I love that really inspires me, if you will, motivates me, challenges me with this. Because I'll be honest, um, even as a pastor who, who tends to be uh, more of like this evangelistic nature, um, I would much rather just, just kind of come from this, uh, you know, hey, I want to share the gospel with everyone rather than having a ton of one-on-one discipleship things. Like, I love discipleship, and I want to make disciples, um, but I'm a pe- I like to bounce around. You guys know me. Like, I'm, I'm boom, 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 boom. Let's tell people about Jesus here and there and here and there. Like, like that's kind of my style. But even with that, even with that, I've been convicted this week, honestly. I really have. I've been, I've been convicted with, with how many conversations I have to where I make uh, the conversation about the gospel with this person secondary. I, I, I will go in in a conversation for whatever reason we're having a conversation. Maybe it was planned. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was designed. Maybe it was scheduled by me or them. Um, regardless, I just want you to know it was designed and it was uh, appointed by God. Every appointment, I believe, and the conversation that we have with people is a divine appointment. And how many times I go into those conversations with something else 
uh, on my mind as a primary uh, means of, 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 of topic or conversation and, and sharing the gospel and asking them where they are spiritually, um, unless obviously I already know, uh, becomes secondary. And so I've been convicted with that this week. And so I, I just want you to know up front, your pastor uh, doesn't have it all together, right? Like I'm, I'm not up here um, trying to, to blast you and say, you got to do better because I'm better and you got to get on my level, like not even saying that at all. But I'm convicted in a way that wants, uh, that, that where I want to, I want I want to change. Like I, I want to step into action. I want to share my faith more. I want to make sure that I view things um, through the lens of what we're going to talk about today. And I want to challenge you to do so as well. All right, Romans chapter 10, verse 14, it says this, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And that someone today, church, is you and I. And so we're going to jump right in. We're going to be in Mark chapter 2 today. But before we do, let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful for the time that we have together to teach and speak from your word. God, I pray you would open our hearts and our minds to hear from you today. I pray that your word would penetrate our hearts, that you would convict us where we need convicting and encourage us where we need encouraging and push us where we need pushing. God, I pray that when we, when we finish here today, that we would have a burning desire to share the gospel message of your son, Jesus Christ, with anybody and everybody that we come in contact with, that it would be our focus, that it would be our, our priority to make sure that people know about the saving love and grace that your son Jesus offers through the death of his own life on a cross, the sacrifice that he made because you made that to send him here for us. God, never let us forget the impact and the power and the price that your son paid for each of us. Be with us today as we continue. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys ready? Let's jump right in. Mark chapter 2, one of the most fascinating stories uh, in regards to sharing the gospel, at least in my opinion. There are quite a few that I enjoy as well, but I really like this story. Uh, and we're just going to hit five verses and, and take off here. So it says, when Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door. So while he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head, then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. This is crazy. Like these guys are literally bringing their friend to Jesus. And I want to pull out three things that will apply to our lives that we can utilize starting right now in this moment. Three reminders, if you will, um, about how to win souls. We're gonna give, I'm going to give you some practical stuff as well. But, but just kind of three reminders in regards to soul winning that, that we need to acknowledge. Uh, and I think you probably know this. But I think the more we can acknowledge it, the better it helps us understand why we don't do it, uh, but it also understand, we understand what it takes to do it, okay? And here it is. The first one is this. If we want to soul win, if we want to win souls, if we want people to come to know Christ uh, and we want to be a part of that, it takes work. It takes work. Like, think about the story. These four men are literally carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. I don't know if you've ever carried someone who couldn't help themselves. Like, the weight of that person is, is almost, you know, doubled to where if they could kind of limp on one leg or could kind of put a little bit of a muscle tone and energy and effort into helping you. This guy was literally paralyzed. He, he literally couldn't do anything. He couldn't move. He couldn't, uh, you know, only thing he could really offer was to lay there on this mat. And so these four guys are literally physically having to work hard to get this man to Jesus. Not only that, when they get there, they see that there's so many people around Jesus that they can't get their friend to him. And so they have to go around back. This is what most scholars believe, that there was, a, there was kind of this, this stairwell, kind of like if you can picture like a, 
like a metal or, or iron uh, ladder, like in an alleyway in, regard, in, you know, in between buildings. Like they, they say that there was like this, this stairwell or ladder around back that these guys had to, had to carry their friend up to, to get on the top of the roof in order to get to Jesus. Like, like this is work. And as I think about the context of this passage, like, like it's, it's a lot of physical work, right? Like these guys are, are physically carrying this weight. They're physically having to go around back and carry him up the ladder. But I don't know about you. I've experienced physical weight, mental weight, spiritual weight, psychological weight, emotional weight. I've experienced a lot of weight trying to get people to Christ, And you know what I'm talking about if you've ever tried to do that. When you sit down with someone and you try to have a conversation with them and you find out where they are and they tell you, I don't believe in God. I don't care about God. And let me tell you why. And they go on this long list of things that has happened in their life. And the things that have happened are are so painful to hear. Maybe they were abused. Maybe they were maybe they were you know sexually you know raped or or, or physically abused or domestic violence or their parents died when they were kids or like all of these tragic things that have happened in their life and they're sharing all this with you and the burden that you feel now the weight that you feel to try to to try to listen to them and come alongside of them and lead them to Christ that becomes heavy and it takes work it takes a lot of work for us to live on a mission to win souls, to get people to to Christ in any way possible. It takes a lot of work. I had a good friend, uh, have a good friend. Um, His name is Chris. And we spent a lot of time together in college and uh, and even a few years after college. Um, But we didn't do, we didn't really do good things together. We we were both kind of living this rebellious life and um, and, and I'm not going to go down that trail today, but, but, but essentially, uh, I finally came to this moment to where I realized I was running so far from God and I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to live for you. And my life drastically changed and I took a 180. Well, uh, all of this is taking place in my life and yet it's not taking place in his life. He, he's staying in this lifestyle. He's, he's, he's kind of being sucked into where he is. He's trapped. Um, and he continues to make some of the same choices and decisions that he made. And, and one of the greatest decisions that I made was to move away from that area. And so I moved, and, and not long after that, God called me to ministry, and then we moved again. Um, and and, and, and I'm, I'm doing my best to live my life uh, pursuing Christ. And, and obviously, the, the work of God in my life was evident. Uh, I say that humbly, like, like my heart had changed, everything about my life had changed, the old lifestyle was gone, the new life in Christ was, was on full display internally and externally, not that I was perfect, but, but I knew what God could do because I experienced it in my old life. And I remember calling him and, and talking to him and saying, hey, man, where are you at? Hey, man, I know you're still sucked into this lifestyle. I know you're still making those choices. And I remember praying for him. I remember calling him and, and literally, hey, you know, praying and, and, and just begging him and begging with God and trying to get him to, to straighten his life out and come to a relationship, a saving relationship in Christ. I remember calling him up because I hadn't heard from him in a few days and I knew what he was doing and I knew that it wasn't good and there was this fear that that, that honestly he was dead uh, because I haven't found him. I haven't heard from him. I remember leaving work one day because I was so worried and, and going to get Kristen, my wife, and driving two and a half hours to where he was living and trying to find him and knocking on his apartment and nobody there and, and riding all around town, nobody there, and calling, 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 nobody there. Like I just remember the, the work that it took, the pain that I felt, the burden that was constantly on my shoulders in this pursuit to try tried to get my friend who I loved and who I cared for to try to get his soul saved by Jesus. It took so much work. And there were times where I'm like, is this, is this even doing anything? Like, is it, is it even worth it? Like, am, am I just going to keep doing this and doing this and doing this and, and getting to this, this dead end road? And I remember some time passed and I had gone a couple months actually without talking to him and I Saw my phone ringing one day, and I looked at it, and it, and it had his name on there, and I was just so excited to hear from him, and I picked it up, man, and the moment I said hello, I could tell something had changed in his voice. And he said, hey, man, I just want you to know, uh, I met a girl, and uh, I went to church with her, and I've been going for a few weeks, and 
there was a guy came in and, and, and we did a revival and he's like, I don't really know how to explain it, but all I know that as he was speaking to me, my hands started sweating, my back started sweating, my heart started fluttering. He said, I can't explain it. I don't know what it was, but I know it wasn't me. He said, I stood up. He said, I've been in church less than 10 times in my entire life, but I stood up in the middle. I started walking down to the front of the church and I got on my face at the altar there and I gave my life to Christ in that moment. And I remember this feeling that that just came over me knowing that, hey, I wasn't the one who saved him, but the work that I put in, it did something. And I don't mean that for selfish gain or to say, look what you did. But I want you to know that the work that you put in to win souls, it has a purpose. And every story, unfortunately, doesn't end that way. Maybe you don't get to get that phone call. Maybe you don't get to see that fruit to where the person you've been working on and investing in and trying to get to Christ doesn't call you up and say, hey, I got saved. It doesn't matter. Our our mission, God's heart for us is to go near and far to win souls for Jesus. But it takes a lot of work. I was thinking about those years to where I was honestly, um, I got saved at a, at a you know at a young age, but but there was this time to where I, I wasn't growing, I wasn't pursuing Christ, and then that moment took place after this rebellious lifestyle, and then I took off on this journey to follow Him and grow in Him as much as I could. But I remember those were some of the early years of what I would say my true Christian development. And there were times I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing when I call this guy my friend and tell him about Jesus. I have no idea what I'm saying. I have no idea what I'm even praying. Like, I don't know if what I'm doing is working. And as I was preparing for, preparing for this, I was reminded God was like, you're right. <laughs> you didn't know what you were doing. But I want you to know, I did. And, I, and he was revealing to me what was actually taking place um, through those years. And, and what was taking place was this. How, how many of you have ever heard of the Great Commission? The Great Commission. I would say a, a good portion of you have. There may be some of you that, that haven't. And, and please don't think that I'm beating you up if, if you haven't, because I'm going to tell you what it is. But before I do... Let me just let me set up a little context here about the Great Commission. I have always heard in my life uh, that the Great Commission was some of Jesus's last words. Okay, so so he came to Earth, he lived his life, he did his ministry, he went to the cross, he died, he went to the grave, he rose, and now he's appearing to to multiple people, uh, hundreds of people. He's having conversations with it with with his disciples, and he's getting ready to ascend back into heaven to be with the Father. And he's speaking some of his last words. And from what I see recorded in Scripture, I agree with that completely. Like it was some of his last words that we receive we see recorded. In scripture. However, one of the things that I've been challenged with recently is when I hear the terms last words, or when I think about someone's life and the last words, um, the, the, the connotations behind that, the implications behind that uh, from, from what we experience leak into what we view the lens and perspective that we view with Jesus's last words, okay? If you're confused, hang tight. Let me explain this, okay? Um, This past week, six years ago, my grandmother passed away. And I remember getting a phone call to say, hey, your grandmother uh, is not doing well at all. She was in hospice, and we're like, hey, we're we're probably in in some of her, her last hours. You should probably drive down and come to see her. And I remember driving down and spending some time there with her and um, just so frail and weak and, um, you know, had lost so much weight. And it was very obvious that she was about to go and be with Jesus. But every once in a while, as the family was there, she would muster up enough energy to say a few words. And the moment that we saw her, her nonverbals, the indications that she would give us that she was about to speak, everybody w- would be really quiet and we would all lean into what she was about to say. And what she said was, was obviously, uh, we, we, we clung to that or cling to that or whatever word you want to use there. Like, like we were leaning in, like we wanted to know. But as I think about a human being's last words, it's often like this, this here's my last wishes, right? Here's my last dreams. Here's what I hope for. I hope you take care of, of your grandpa. 
you know. I hope you keep going to church. Like, like, like these last words. And the problem is when we view Jesus' last words like that, we view this great commission that we are about to read as a wish or a hope. Listen, these were the last words of Jesus, but this wasn't a farewell speech. This was more like an inauguration, meaning Jesus' last words on earth wasn't, I'm out of here, goodbye. It's, hey, I'm about to take office. I'm about to leave this place and go be at the right hand of the Father where I belong as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And these things that I'm about to say to you, these last words, these aren't a wish. These aren't hopes. These aren't dreams. This is a promise. This is what I am going to do. And this is the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus came and he told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is not a wish. This is not something Jesus is saying, I hope this happens. This is saying, this is the great commandment. I mean, the great commission, excuse me. This is the great commission. And you're going to go, and you're going to teach, and you're going to baptize, and you're going to make disciples all over the world. And the way that I'm going to do that is through my gospel message, through my church, and with power. I'm going to do it through the story, the gospel, the good news of my life. That's, that's what's going to go far and wide, and that's what's going to make disciples. But the people that are going to do it is my church, the body of Christ, believers who are going to go. It's not a wish. It's not a hope. It is a promise that this is going to take place, and they're going to go with power. Well, what power is that, Brian? I'm so glad you asked. Acts chapter 1. So, so we go Matthew 28, last chapter of Matthew. And then and Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all, all the Gospels. And then it goes to Acts, okay? And so, so this is some of his last words as well. Like this is his, his very last words. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So you are going to go and make disciples. My church is going to be the one who does that, and you're going to have this with you everywhere that you go. This is not a wish. This is not a hope. This is the Great Commission, and it is a promise, and this is who's going to be with you as you go. I don't know about you, but that encourages me to know that this isn't something that Jesus just hopes is going to happen. This is something that is going to happen, and I am either going to be a part of it or I'm not. And if he's commanded me to do it, I want to know that I'm a part of it because it means that I'm being obedient to what he's commanded me to do. And not only that, (laughs) glory, I don't have to do it on my own because I have the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of me. And guess what the the power of the Holy Spirit uh, uh, can do? It can change people's life. It it can win souls. You're just the vessel and the means to get that message to these people. And the Holy Spirit does the work. I don't know about you. I'm thankful that I can work but not have to work, right? Like, it's hard work. But it isn't actually me who saves somebody. And so I get to focus on the hard work of my part. And I get to let God focus and do the hard work of his part, which isn't even really hard because he can do whatever he wants. But it's beautiful. It's encouraging to know that the Holy Spirit goes before us and leads us and guides us. And we're not alone when we go and win souls. So the Great Commission. All right. I want to break this down. I really wish I had a whiteboard up here. uh, But Pastor Jay would fuss at me if I did that because he would say there's a glare on the camera. And um, it's not up to his standards. All right. So all the good looking stuff online. That's Pastor Jay. If there's anything that isn't up to par, it means Pastor Jay wasn't here and Brian ended up having to edit it, all right? (laughs) You'll be able to tell the difference if you pay attention. Anyways, here we go. The Great Commission is what? Go and make disciples. That's the Great Commission. Obviously, it says baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them that those are just parts of this. There's only one command. 
go and make disciples. First off, the term go, you don't have to go to another country. The, 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 the words, the Greek, the Greek use here for go actually means as you are going. So, so go as you're going. Actually, you can wake up on a Monday morning and you can make disciples before you even leave your house. Because as you're going, as I'm going to have coffee with my wife, as I'm going to say good morning to my kids, I'm going to make disciples. And so first off, it starts in your home, okay? Anyways, as you're going, make disciples, all right? And so here's what I would do if I had a whiteboard. I would say to you, what would you say are some of the characteristics of discipleship? Like, if we're to go and make disciples, obviously discipleship is what leads people to becoming uh, a disciple, right? So, like, like, what are some of those characteristics? And I would listen to your response, and I would write them down. And I'm just going to throw a few up there. This isn't all of them, so I'm not saying this is a magic formula. But I would turn around, and I would say, okay, discipleship. All right, teaching. Yep, we're going to teach people, right? That's in the Great Commission. We're going to baptize, right? Okay, that's a step of obedience, meaning, hey, we're discipling now because we're being obedient to God's Word. We're, 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 we're taking steps forward. All right, I'm investing, okay? I'm not just going to throw it out and say, hey, here's Jesus. I hope, that, um, I hope that you accept this invitation. I'm out, right? Like, there may be seasons where you have to do that. Uh, but, but, but true discipleship is investing. That's why we have city homes where we're literally investing in each other. And then we're maturing and we're growing. Like, these are characteristics. These are attributes of discipleship. Okay? So, what if I flip the question and I ask you, well, what's evangelism? Like, what, what, is it, what, is it, what, is ev- what does it mean to evangelize? So, so we're going to go and make disciples. So, hey, here's some of the things I'm going to do. Discipleship, right? Okay, and so here's what I would ask you. What's evangelism? And this thing is off-centered, so don't judge me. Pastor Jay is probably shaking his head right now if he's watching this. All right, just slide that over a little bit. Boop, here we go. All right, so evangelism, what is that? All right, it's sharing, right? Sharing the gospel, sharing the good news of Jesus, throwing seeds. There's a story in Scripture called the parable of the soil. We're, we're, we're throwing out seeds. It's not our job to determine what the soil is. It's our job to throw seeds on the soil. God is the one who gets the soil ready. In the, the parable, the story, the soil is the heart. God does the heart. We're, we're throwing out the seed. And, and we pray that it lands on good soil, right? Preaching, right? Like, and you don't have to be a preacher to preach. We're, 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 we're teaching and we're speaking the, God's word and the truth that is there. We're announcing Hey, let me tell you about my Jesus, baby. Let me tell you about him. And you don't even have to go to God's word. Just tell them about your Jesus because of your life. Like you're just announcing, hey, I once was this, but now I'm here. I used to do this, but now I do that. Like you're just announcing all that God is doing. And you can announce scripture as well. And then communicating. Hey, let's have a conversation. Do you believe in heaven or hell? If you died today, where would you go? Do you believe that, 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 that God sent his son Jesus to save you? Like, like we're, ju- we're just we're communicating, okay? So we have evangelism. We have discipleship. And here, here I'm going to put both of them up here for you. Here's where I think sometimes we struggle. Because we read the Great Commission, go and make disciples. And then we think about discipleship, 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 discipleship. And that's good. We have to. We're commanded to make disciples. We have to disciple, and we have to use aspects of discipleship to make disciples. But here's the deal. There is no, there is no line down the middle. There is no discipleship is discipleship, and evangelism is evangelism. They're not separate. They go together. And, and so at this time on the whiteboard, I would draw a big circle and show you how they connect. But let me just give you a quote that I found here by Matt Brown. It says, discipleship isn't full circle unless we're doing evangelism. Evangelism isn't full circle unless we're discipling. And so there's so many aspects to this that we could talk about. But here's what I want to talk about today. So winning of evangelism. It's the beginning of discipleship. And the goal, as I said, I would draw this circle, is that I and you, we are are evangelizing. Let me say you and I. We're we're evangelizing, okay? We're sharing the gospel, and and, and we pray that this person 
is, is now accepting the gospel. Now we take the next step into discipleship, and we grow them, and we mature them, not by us, but, but God is using us, and they get down here to the bottom to where now they are disciples. They, 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 they are they're disciples. They are a true disciple. We went from evangelism, we used discipleship, now we've made a disciple, and the, 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 the goal is now that this disciple circles back around to the top and now evangelizes. And it just keeps going. I'm going to make a disciple. And then they're going to evangelize. And they're going to make a disciple. And they're going to evangelize. And then they're going to make a disciple. And we have all of this going on at once. Like our job, God's heart for us, is to go and make disciples. And a huge part of that, the very beginning of that process, is to win souls. To lead people to Christ. That's why I love our mission statement. We're going to guide people to life in Christ. Can I just remind you? It's hard. It's hard. It's, it's simple, but it's hard. And quite frankly, we've made it harder than it should be. But I know it's hard. And I'm not saying that, it, you know, I want you to know it's hard, but that is not a, an excuse to not do it. All right? So let's win souls. It's hard. All right, number two. Here we go. It takes boldness. So not only does it take work, hard work, it takes boldness. Look at this story again. Mark chapter 2, verse 4. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. All right? Let me say it a different way. Same verse. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head so that they could get the man to Jesus. I think sometimes we read scripture and we just say, oh, that's cool. Like, great. They dug a hole and they got him down because the crowds were there and they couldn't get him to Jesus. Listen, they literally ripped a man's roof off. I don't know about you. I would probably call that boldness. Have you ever got up on somebody else's house and said, hey, we're about to get down here and see what's happening. And since we can't get through the front door or we can't pull up in the driveway, we're just going to walk around back and climb up the ladder and we're going to pull the roof off. Like, come on, guys. Like, this is boldness, crazy boldness. And we have to be bold if we are going to attempt to win souls for Christ because we're going to have conversations with people who intimidate us. We're going to have conversations with people who are going to cuss us out. We're going to have conversations with people who are going to say, bro, I don't care about your Jesus, and you better get out of my face. Like, and we got to be bold. I didn't say be stupid. <laughs> I said be bold. And when you are bold and you are, you are willing to work, then sharing the gospel of Jesus becomes a priority. I read a book years ago uh, called One Thing You Can't Do in Heaven. One Thing You Can't Do in Heaven. You know what that means? And don't say Dallas Cowboys not winning a Super Bowl, all right? Because we're going to win a Super Bowl in heaven <laughs> since we can't win one here. Just kidding. Anyway, the one thing you can't do in heaven is lead somebody to Christ. <laughs> They're already there because of that. And so, anyways, I read the book. I think his name is um, Mark Cahill. I could be wrong, but look it up. One thing you can't do in heaven. Anyways. This guy is, is an evangelist, and he literally lives his life, obviously, trying to win souls. But he was a basketball player for Auburn University, and he had a pretty popular roommate. And his roommate was Charles Barkley. And so if you're a basketball fan, you know who Charles Barkley is. If you're not a basketball fan, you probably still know who Charles Barkley is. But, but he was Charles's roommate, and they became friends. And obviously, um, Charles went on to, you know, NBA career, and now he's famous, et cetera. Well, in this book, uh, again, I think his name's Mark. I'm just going to say Mark, all right? Uh, Mark talks about his relationship with Charles, like, even to this day. And they're still, they were good college roommates. They were good friends. And so he travels around and speaks. Well, anytime he is near where Charles may be, whether he's at his home or he's, you know, off playing golf or whatever it may be, He'll call Charles up and say, hey, I'm in town, and uh, I'd love to hang out. Well, he tells this story about a time when he was in Phoenix, Arizona, and I don't know if that's where Charles Barkley lives. Maybe he does, or maybe he did at this time, or maybe he was just there. I don't know. But he called Charles. He said, hey, I'm in town, and uh, I'd love to hang out. And Charles said, yeah, I would love for you to come hang out with us. Come on by tonight. And Mark says, well, who is us? 
He said, well, we got, I got a few, few friends in town. He said, Michael's in town. And, uh, and Mark goes, Michael? Like, My, Michael who? And he says, Michael Jordan. He's like, oh, all right. Well, then, yeah, I'm coming over. And so he comes to where they are, and they weren't actually at Charles's house. They were at a cigar bar, and basically Charles is, is uh, from what this guy reports, a, a big partier. He likes to stay out late. And, and so he said, I was in this cigar bar till like 1 o'clock in the morning. All the lights come on. They run everybody off, and the owner comes and says, hey, uh, you guys can stay as long as you want. Don't worry about it. And he says, then they start all taking shots, not Mark, uh, but like everybody's taking shots. Everybody's kind of... Um, probably, you know, a little, a little over the line here with, with, uh, with alcohol consumption or smoking cigars or talking. And, uh, and Mark has a mission to just really talk to Michael. Um, but he didn't want to just talk to him about anything. He wanted to ask him where he was spiritually. And so he, he describes the feelings that he was feeling and just say, man, like, here's Michael Jordan. And I really want to talk to him about Jesus, but here we are at a bar, he's partying, he's probably half lit, like what's going to happen here? And he said, I kept pushing back, I kept waiting on opportunity, kept pushing back, kept waiting on opportunity, and I would turn, I'd push away. And he said, finally, it was time to leave. He's like, and I knew, like, all right, here's my moment, like I better figure this out, I better do it, like if I'm going to do it, this is what I came to do, I got to step into this. He said, they were walking out, and he said, hey, Michael, and he started asking a couple questions, and you know, hey, what, what, what do you think is going to happen when you leave here? You're going to go to heaven or hell? And he said, I'm going to heaven. He said, well, do you have a relationship with Jesus? And, and Michael says, yes. And I, I don't know, you know, if that's true or not true. But I just think about, like, being in the context of a high-profile celebrity like that and making it a priority to ask this man, knowing, knowing, like, you talk about boldness. Like, he literally went out in boldness to say, Michael. Do you know Jesus? Do you, if you die today, are you going to heaven or hell? Like, like that is boldness. And by statistics, at least half of you watching this haven't shared your faith in the last year, statistically. So, so half of you could just go ahead and sit down. If I was to ask who would do that, half of you statistically could go ahead and sit down. The other half, I would say these st statistics are on a normal basis meaning not high-profile celebrities. Like, I just think, how many of us would have literally had a chance to meet Michael Jordan and the number one priority on our mind was to ask him where he stood in his relationship with Jesus? I would say very few. Very few, it, if any. Right? Michael, hey, can I get your autograph? Michael, hey, come on, bro, let's take a picture. Hey, Michael. You, could you FaceTime my kid right quick and say what's up? Hey, Michael, you got a jersey? Like, this guy said, I don't care about your autograph. I don't care about your picture. I want to know what really matters. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Like, are you bold in sharing your faith? Are you bold in winning souls? You say, well, Brian, how, how do I do that? How do I do that? I'm going to give you a few of those. Let me just share a couple, couple other statistics that I found. And this, this study is um, it's a few years old. And so I would imagine the numbers have changed, but I would almost imagine that they're actually worse in the context of what we're looking at. But check this out. Unchurched people, this was done by Lifeway, by the way. Unchurched people are not coming back to church. 66% said they were unlikely to attend a church service anytime soon. And 49% very unlikely to attend a church at all. So unchurched people, people who don't know Jesus, almost 50% of them said, I'm not going to church. And 66% said, I'm not going anytime soon. This is pre-COVID. So I can only imagine what the numbers are now. It goes on to say, check this out. This is the flip side. Although they say they're not going to go to church, although they said, you know, not anytime soon or not at all, unchurched people are interested in faith. A whopping 79% said, if a friend of mine really values their faith, I don't mind talking about it with them. 79%. That's almost eight out of your 10 friends who you know that don't know Jesus and don't know the church are interested in talking to you about your faith because they see the value of it in your life. 
And yet, how often do we look at our friends who aren't saved and don't go to church, and we automatically create this assumption or this stereotype that they don't care, and therefore, I'm not going to waste my time talking to them about my Jesus. Like, dude, this is astounding. And here, here's, the, here's the next one. I don't, I'll just say this. I don't 100% agree with this statement. You're like, well, Brian, why are you saying it? Because there's so much value here. But I do think that there is so much significance in this, and it fits with what we are trying to do here at Seven Cities Church. Francis Chan says, evangelism in the future does not happen in our temples or cathedrals, but in our living rooms and our houses. You know what he's saying? He's saying, stop focusing on a Sunday morning service as a way to reach lost people. You just saw 50 of them out of 100 ain't coming. They're not going to come to your church. They're not going to step foot in your building. It doesn't mean that we don't come together and worship corporately because there's power in that. But for an unchurched person and an unsaved person, there is no significance to them about that. So what do we do? Our living rooms and our houses. Can you take that literal? Absolutely. But you want to know what the principle is? Make it personal. Stop inviting them to church and invite them to a relationship with Jesus. Like, I want them to come to church. I want you who are watching online to come to church. Like, I want to see your face. I want to hug you. I want to talk to you. I want to touch you as I pray for you. I want to be able to know what's going on in your life. And as you share your story with me, I want to be able to see your face. I want to be able to know what's happening and the burden that you feel. So that as one of your pastors, I can shepherd you. I can lead you. I can help you. I'm not perfect. I don't have it all together. I don't have all the answers. But I do know that I love you and that I care about you. And this isn't some manipulative plea to say quit watching online and come in church. That's not what I'm saying at all. All I'm saying is that as we go and we try to win souls for Jesus, it has to be personal. We've got to make it personal. Invite people into your home. Like, like city homes, listen, if you're watching online for whatever reason, but one of them is I do not want to go to a church where there are a lot of people, I perfectly and, and completely am not going to argue with you or go against that. I, you do what you feel is best for you. Here's what I'm begging. And whether you do, like, I'll go to a church, I just haven't. Or I'm not going to church because I don't feel safe or whatever. Can you get into a home? Like, like can you get into a home? And not only that, Can you invite somebody who doesn't know Jesus with you? City homes are not small groups for a bunch of believers. They're not not just solely intended to have a little Sunday school lesson in a home. They're intended to operate like a church. And you have friends who will never step foot in a building on a Sunday morning, but will go to somebody's house with you and have a meal and sit around a living room and have conversation. Let's make it personal, church. Let's win souls. And it takes hard work, and it takes boldness. All right? Real quick, because we're running out of time here. How do I share my faith? If I'm going to make it personal, how do I share my faith, Brian? And, and these, I'm going to give you five things. This doesn't mean that this is the only five. I just think it's just five important ones that you can focus on right now. And they're, they're, they're pretty simple. But, but here's the first one. <laughs> Live a godly life. Like, You want to tell somebody about your Jesus who saved your life and changed you and transformed you, but yet your life looks just like the world's? No, thank you. Right? Like, you got to live a godly life. If you want to have credibility and character and integrity and power to go and win souls for Jesus Christ, you better live your life as if he saved your soul. (laughs) Come on, somebody, somebody better say amen, whether your toes just got stepped on or not. I love you. But live a godly life. Let's let's let people look at our life and say, I ain't going to that church. But I do want to talk to that person because they got something that I want. I'm not sure what it is, but, but look at how they live their life. It's different. It's joyful. Like, I'm going to live a godly life. Let's, let's live a godly life so that we don't ruin our, our message or our testimony or our witness by the choices that we make. Are you perfect? No. But pursue God in everything that you do and let your life tell that story. All right? Number two, pray. Oh, duh, Brian. <laughs> no, pray. Pray. When's the last time you literally said, God, I pray today 
that you would create and give me an opportunity to share the gospel with somebody. And I'm just telling you, when you pray that, you better get ready because you're going to see things differently. But what if that was our prayer every day? God, help me share your message today. God, help me, help me let somebody know about Jesus today. God, help me preach the gospel in word or in action. Like, when's the last time you prayed to share your faith? All right, number three, keep it simple. Keep it simple. Listen, I'm no theologian. <laughs> I, this is my, I'll keep it simple. Hey, look, I don't know everything about the Bible, but we can study it together. I can, I can show you where to start, and we can look at it together. I, 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 I don't really know, you know, all the answers. There's things that I don't understand. Like, like quit, quit trying to go into, like, all of these crazy theological dispensations and doctrines. Like, like just keep it simple. Am I saying that stuff's not important? No, not at all. But quit thinking that you have to be some great scholar or theologian to share your faith. You don't. Just keep it simple. Keep it personal and keep it simple. Number four, tell your story. This is the most powerful one that you have, telling your story. Because guess what? Now it's not just something that you're telling me from God's word or from the Bible, who most of the time those people are like, eh, I'm not even sure if I believe the Bible. Now it's this connection to where, hey, I know you. And now I'm, I'm, I'm telling a story that is personal. Like, and now that person gets to see a face and a name and a human being and a life that's connected to the power of the gospel that I'm trying to tell you about. Oh, man, it's powerful. And guess what? Nobody can tell your story like you. You don't have to know anything. You don't have to study anything. You don't have to memorize a verse. All you got to do is tell your story. This is what my life looked like. I had an encounter, and I met Jesus, and I entered into a saving relationship with him, and now look at my life. Number five, invite them to their next step. And, it, and I said this kind of broad because it's your place, especially if it's somebody who, again, this is kind of challenging because like foreign missions, international missions, you're not going to spend a year, you know? You're going to go and you're going to tell people about Jesus and you're moving on. So I'm talking about kind of in a local context, somebody that you can create and develop a relationship with. Invite them to their next step. And guess what? Their next step might be different than the other person's next step. And so I say it this way because you got to figure that out. Maybe they do want to go to church and they're waiting on an invitation. Maybe they don't and they want to be invited into a city home. Maybe they don't. They want to go and, you know, have dinner together. And, and talk more. Have coffee together. Talk more. Maybe they're, they're ready to, to get baptized. Because, hey, I'm ready. I'm ready, to make, I'm ready to give my life to Christ right now and get baptized tonight. Like, maybe it is. Hey, I'm ready to take the step into salvation. Like, like, find out what their next step is and invite them to it. The power of personal invitation is astounding. And yet we just have this mindset that people don't care or don't want to know. And you'll never know that until you try. Okay? And it takes work. And it takes boldness. Number three, it takes faith. It takes faith. And we're almost done. This story one more time. Mark chapter two, verse five. Seeing their faith. So, that, so they drop him down through the roof. And Jesus says, seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. So the story goes on and he heals him physically. But look, <laughs> he heals him spiritually first. My child, your sins are forgiven. Not, hey, pick up your mat and walk. He does say that, but he deals with the heart of this man. And he says, their faith. Now, his friend's faith didn't actually literally and spiritually save him. His, his heart had to be in that place. He had to make that decision on his own. But you know what? These guys, and this is why I think Jesus says their faith, they said, look, we got a friend who we know needs Jesus, and we got to do whatever it takes to get him there. And it's going to be hard work, and it's going to take boldness. But we have the faith to believe if we can just get him to Jesus, things will change. Things will change. And this is what happens. He says, their faith. I don't know about you. I want a friend like that. I don't know about you. I want to be that friend. I want, I want to be a part of someone's faith journey. Again, I know it's not me who saves them. 
I don't, I don't want that responsibility. I'm thankful that I'm not the one who saves people. But God will use the gospel of his son, Jesus, through the church of his people by the power of the Holy Spirit to lead people to Christ. When's the last time you shared your faith? When's the last time you had this type of faith? Because listen, if you have the faith that these guys do, to say, I know all I've got to do, all i got to do is get them to Jesus, and their life is going to be transformed. The things that you do, the work that you put in, the intentionality that you put in, the risks that you take, the boldness that comes out will be so important and so relevant and so prevalent in your life because you know all i got to do is my part, and I'm going to get them here to Jesus, and oh my gosh, their life's going to be changed. I, I want to live with that kind of faith. I don't want to write people off. Say, bro, you see that person? There ain't no way they are ever going to get saved. You see the way they live their life? There, you see the cycle that they're in? in life? There's no way. That's not faith. That's not faith at all. That's judgment. And that's assumption. And that's limiting the power of God based off of your little brain. And my little brain. Excuse me. Uh, I'm not pointing fingers. I mean, I did, but. I want this type of faith. I want to win souls for Jesus because that is the heart of God. Last verse, and I'm done. 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 6. This is good and pleases God our Savior. This is the heart of God. You ready? Who wants everyone to be saved and understand the truth. He wants everyone to be saved and understand the truth. For there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone, and this is the message God gave to the world at just the right time. Where are you at today? I don't know about you. I want to live on mission. I want to live on mission. I want to carry out the Great Commission in both aspects. Again, they're not separate. They are different, but they're not separate. But I know that my first step is to, is to evangelize people. I can't disciple someone who doesn't know Jesus. And I think that oftentimes when we think about the Great Commission, we sometimes neglect those who do not know Christ. Because we think that just because the commission is to make disciples, that it has to be focused solely on saved people. It does. But your responsibility is to get unsaved people saved so that you can disciple. And so let's not neglect that church. Let's reach people. Let's do it in our everyday life. Quit waiting on a church or an organization to create an outreach event for you to reach lost people. Make it happen in every aspect of your life. When you go to work, when you go to school, when you go to class, when you go to uh, the, the ballpark, when you go to the grocery store, like wherever it is, you have an opportunity. Share your faith. Ask people those questions. It takes work, it takes boldness, and it takes faith. But I want people to know Jesus. Because you know what? When I see people who say, I don't have hope, I say, hey, I know the solution to that. I don't have joy. <laughs> I know the solution to that. Hey, I don't know what's going to happen to me after I die. I know the solution to that. I don't have purpose in my life. I know the solution to that. I don't have value. I know the solution to that. I got the solution. And I will not keep that to myself. Why would we allow people to live this life and go to an eternal place of pain and torment and die in a burning hell, separated from God forever when we have the solution. Again, we don't save them. But who can call upon the name of the Lord if they never heard it? Who's going to tell them? You and me. Let's do it, church. Sorry, I thought I was landing. I got a little fired up there, all right?
Let's go. Let's go win souls for Jesus, church. That is God's heart. And I want to be a part of seeing people come to Christ. And I'm telling you right now, if you have never done it, if you have never been a part, like personally, I, I, it is, I mean, I love when I'm standing on a stage and people raise their hand and give their life to Christ because of a sermon. Like, I love that. But I'm telling you, it, it, it falls in comparison to a one-on-one personal relationship where you begin to guide somebody through all the baggage and stuff of their life and questions and doubts and fears and whatever it is, and they come to accept Jesus Christ. It is transformational in your life. Obviously, there's even more so, but it's powerful. It's powerful. Don't sit back. Let's go. Let's tell people about the good news of Jesus far and wide. Last thing I'm going to say, three billion people in this world right now who have never heard the name of Jesus. Three billion people. You say, hey, you know Jesus? They say, who's that? Hey, you know Jesus? I don't know. Where, where, what villages do you live in? Three billion people. Three billion people. Come on. If we can get it right here, if we can start doing this, then we can go and we can reach those people. Let's go. Let's don't sit back. Let's go reach the people with gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's win souls because that is God's heart. Amen? All right. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for this time. Thank you for who you are. God, I pray that you would encourage us motivate us, inspire us, push us, convict us to go and share the good news of Jesus with everybody we encounter. Don't let us sit back in our comfortable American dream and bubble and, 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 and security, Lord. Like, push us out, God. Help us to be bold. Yes, it's going to be hard. I don't know about you. I do know about you, God. Like, I'm thankful that you give us the Holy Spirit to push us out to be bold and to have the power that you provide to us, the same power that brings dead things to life. And for a moment, we think that we don't have what it takes or qualified or equipped to go and tell people about Jesus. Can we be reminded of that power who lives within us as believers? God, I pray right now, if there's anybody at the sound of my voice who's never entered into a relationship with you, God, I pray that they would understand in this moment that you sent your son Jesus to die on a cross for their sins a sin that they could not pay for on their own, a sacrifice that had to be paid. And your son Jesus paid that. And that life that was, that was punished, that died on that cross, is the payment, is the, is the solution for us to be able to spend eternity with you. God, I pray that someone would acknowledge that today and accept you as their Lord and Savior right now in this moment. God, we are so thankful for who you are and all that you do for us. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen. Hope you have a great day. I love you guys. We'll see you soon.